to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the psalmist said my sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden they're too heavy for me to bear psalm 38 and verse 4. welcome to our study of the high cost of sin we live in a world that acts like sin is pleasurable it's fun to name things as sinful we just view it as part of life it's just a way of living sin is commonplace well god wants his people in the new testament to understand the high cost of sin and to not take it for granted, to realize it for what it is. And so today we're going to think about what will sin cost you? If you view sin as the world views it, if you get involved in sin and don't make it right, what is sin going to cost you in this life? We first learn in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4 that sin costs death. The soul that sins, Ezekiel said, will surely die. Now, are we talking about physical death? Not necessarily. That may be a, a casualty of that. But when we talk about death, we're talking about spiritual death. The soul who sins is going to die and wither spiritually because he's outside of Jesus, the Son of God. He's outside of the grace of God. The Bible tells us that sin is unrighteousness. 1 John 3 verse 4, 1 John chapter 5 verse 17, sin is unrighteousness and it will cause us to live a life that is not right in the sight of God. What else will sin cost us? Proverbs 13 verse 15 says, the way of the transgressor is hard. People promote sin as though it's fun, as though it's the best life to live, but you need to listen carefully what God says. Sin is going to cost you. It's going to be the hardest life. It's going to be the hardest life you have ever lived. Oh, there may be gratifying pleasure immediately. Hebrews 11.25, a passing pleasure, but that pet pleasure does pass. That joy does fade. That, that, that fun gets less each time. It's going to cost you maybe your health. It might cost you friends. It may even cost you, if you don't repent of it, heaven itself. And so it's the hard life. Here's what Paul said about the cost of sin in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The scripture says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, the wages being spiritual death. If I remain in sin and live in sin and die in sin, I'm going to go where sinners go, to that horrible place called hell, a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a, a place where there'll be great sorrow, a place of eternal darkness. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 20. A, a place for comfort. The rich man wanted just one drop of water. And so, yes, sin will cost me greatly. Sin dirties my life. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, the Bible says, All our righteousness is like filthy rags. Apart from God, without the sacrifice of Jesus, living dependent upon ourself, our sin's like filthy rags. It's a stain or a spot. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, And sin will cost us greatly when it comes to the kingdom. I want you to think about Simon. In Acts chapter 8, Simon obeys the gospel. He, he becomes a Christian. He now sees the gift of God and he reverts back to his old life. He tries to buy that gift with money. I'll give you money if you give me that gift. And Peter says to him, your money perish with you. You thought you could purchase the gift of God with money. Your heart is not right in God. And he told him, repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart may be forgiven you. What happened to Simon? Simon had salvation. He's now going to perish. Simon was in the kingdom. He was where all spiritual blessings are. Now he's outside of it. 
He was outside of the grace and the favor of God and those who loved righteousness. And so notice what sin will cost you, not only as we think about certain scriptures, but what's sin going to cost me in this life? Ultimately, sin will cost me my soul. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4 again. The Bible simply says, The soul... Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Sin will cost you the most precious and the most valuable thing ever, your soul. Again, think about the rich fool. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. This man had a great crop year. And so he said to his soul, so you've got many goods laid up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry in essence. Do you know what God said to that man? You fool. This night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you've acquired? What did that man lose? He lost it all. He lost his soul. Think about what Jesus said concerning the value of the soul. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. What will it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing can compare with the value of your soul. And if you have all the fun, you have all the pleasure, you've got all the wealth, and you don't go to heaven, you've lost it all. The Bible says the soul returns to God. The Spirit returns to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. He who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. This old world and all that's in it is one day going to fade away, but he who does the will of God, that's the person who will live forever. And the problem with losing your soul is that when you lose your soul, you've lost it all, but you haven't lost your memory. Remember Luke chapter 16? The rich man is on the other side in torment, and he says, Abraham says to him, Son, remember. The problem with losing your soul is that if you go to hell and you're lost eternally, you're going to regret it every waking moment. You're going to remember what you had in this life. You're going to remember the opportunities that you didn't seize. You're going to remember gospel sermons that you've heard and that you didn't obey. And can't you imagine how horrible that will be for all eternity? And so sin cost you the greatest thing ever. It will cost you your eternal soul. Sin cost you a separation from God himself. I want you to notice again the words of Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. The scripture says... Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Sin causes that relationship with God and man to be severed. And that's what Jesus came to do, to bring that relationship back together. And the reason being... God is of purer eyes than to behold evil. He can't even look upon wickedness. God can't even view it. That's how holy he is. Well, someone says, well, why is that so bad to be separated from God? Here's what you're missing out on. You're separated from the source of all love. 1 John 4 verse 8, God is love. There's no love, and all of us need that. There's no love in a life where God doesn't exist. Behold what manner of love, John said, the Father has bestowed upon us that we can be called children of God. All oh, the people of the world may tell you they love you. The devil may make you think he loves you. But friend, they'll stab you in the back and I can promise you the devil is a father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. You're without love. You're separated from God's help in the avenue of prayer. Dude, did you realize that if you live a life of sin, you can't pray to God? John 9, the rich man or the blind man was right. God does not hear the prayer of sinners. The man who sins against the marriage relationship and doesn't deal with his wife properly, even his prayers are hindered. Proverbs 28, verse 9, the proverb writer said, the man who turns his ear away from hearing the law of God, his prayer is an abomination. God says, don't pray to me if you're not going to listen to me. And notice what the psalmist said in Psalm 66 and verse 18. The scripture says, 
if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I've got sin in my life, God's not going to hear my prayer, and so I'm separated from love. I'm separated from communicating with God. I don't have all spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings are the Christians who's living in Christ. In Christ, I've got everything I need for life and godliness. The promise he's promised us is eternal life, and Jesus said the righteous would go away into eternal life. Yet, if sin separates me from God and sin separates me from Christ... I don't have those spiritual blessings. And whether you realize it or not, when you separate yourself from God, automatically you align yourself with the devil. You're the devil's friend. He's got you right where he wants you. You're in his army. He's that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He, like Peter, wants to separate you from the wheat and the chaff and use you for his service. And so you're now on the devil's side if you have become separated from God. Well, what else is sin going to do? Sin is going to make you a slave. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 tells us, whoever we present ourselves to, whether sin, uh, sin slaves of sin or slaves of obedience, we are that one slave. If I give myself to a life of sin, I'm enslaved by it. Think about this for just a moment. Think of all the people that you can probably imagine in your own life who probably just started out using drugs recreationally for just a little fun. And you can look at their life now, and it is a life of misery. They're looking for and doing whatever it takes to get their next fix. They're involved in criminal activity, likely. Uh, it's affected their health. It's affected their family, affected their marriage. They've severed themselves from many of their past friends. Why? because they're a slave to that drug. Think about all the people whose lives have been wrecked by alcohol, the families that have been torn apart, the relationships that have been broken, the people whose health has been damaged. The Bible tells us wine's a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Why is it those people can't break free from it? Well, they can, but they are deeply enslaved to alcohol. Think about those who work the streets in different towns, prostitutes, hookers, things of that nature. Why is it that they do that? They've given themselves over to slavery. They have become enslaved by that lust and by that passion. We need to realize if I get involved in sin, it's going to cost me. Sin is going to make me its slave. I'm going to let it be my master. And whatever sin it is that's ruling my life, I'm going to let that in slavery, that, in, that captivity, cause me to do whatever I have to to keep living and keep doing that sin. You know, as a country, we look back on the times of slavery and we're appalled by that. And yet individually... Sometimes we let our lives become a life of slavery to sin. Would you willingly look at yourself as a slave? Would you want someone to think of you as that way? Then why give yourself to sin? Sin makes you its slave. It becomes your master, and you are at its whim and desire. You must be careful not to get involved in the slavery of sin. But you know, sin might also cost you your physical health. I want you to think about people in the Bible, people in Scripture who did get involved in sin, and it cost them. You remember Uriah? They're bringing the ark of God back. They're leading it on a new cart. Uh, they are following it, and it crosses Nathan's threshing floor, and Uriah reaches up to stabilize the ark of God, drops dead on the spot. Why? Because he broke the law of God. They weren't to touch it, and sin cost that man his life. Think about another example. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Nadab and Abihu offer a profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. What happened? Fire rained down from heaven and consumed and seared their bodies. That cost them physically their life. Think about a New Testament example. Do you remember the famous couple, Ananias and Sapphira? They could have done what they wished with their money. It was theirs. They could have made the choice they wanted to. They lied to the Holy Spirit, agreed together to do that. Both of them dropped dead and died on the spot. And so sin cost them physically. Think about what sexual pleasure and sexual lust have cost people today. AIDS, STDs. Think of the number of people's lives who have been ruined 
by the cost of sin. Think about the number of alcoholics who have liver disease, who have heart problems, those who use cigarettes and tobacco. Think about the lung cancer, the lip cancer that is involved in that. Think about the number of drunk drivers who've killed people on our roads. Why? All because of sin. Sin costs people their physical health. Now, what are we to do with our bodies? We're not to give it over to sin, but notice what we are to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 says this, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. My body and my spirit are to be used for Christ's glory. I'm not to use it for myself. It no longer belongs to me. And thus I must not give myself over to a life of sin. Sin will also cost you family and friends. Think about the marriage relationships that have been broken up because a husband or a wife violated the bonds, the holy bonds of marriage and committed adultery. Think about the children who suffer because of that. The Bible says marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. It may cost you the family. Think about what it cost the first family in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve decide to eat of the tree that God has commanded them not to eat of. They do that, and as a result, sin enters their family. They're cast out of the garden. They have to work by the sweat of their brow, and it did greatly affect the family. Think about how pornography has affected the family today. Matthew chapter 5, verses 26 through 32, Jesus clearly taught us, we're not to look at a woman to lust after her or we've committed adultery in our heart. Think about the number of homes, the number of relationships, the number of children who've been hurt because of pornography. Think about the number of children who are being raised by someone else because mom and dad couldn't get their lives right because they let sin enslave them and use them and now they cannot give their lives to God or their family because they've become entrapped in that sin. They just can't seem to let it go. And thus sin affects the Christian family. We need to realize it will cost us friends, it'll cost us family, and we cannot get involved in a life of sin. I am to be an example to the believers, not be caught up in sin. I am to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew 5 verse 6 and I especially want you to notice what Jesus said our attitude and mindset should be towards sin. The Apostle Paul echoing some of the sentiments of Jesus said this, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather expose them. How am I to feel about sin? Don't fellowship it. Don't have anything to do with it. Instead, I am to expose sin in my life. Finally, let's think about one cost, one tragic cost of sin that most people who get involved in it don't want to deal with. Sin will cost you a life in eternity in that place we call hell. We don't like to think about hell. We live in a world that would rather uh, forget about that place called hell. If you're going to live a life of sin, you need to think about the consequences of that place. Now, let me remind you of two men. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31 tells us this story. There was a poor man named Lazarus. He was a beggar. He's at the rich man's table eating the food that the, falls below the table and the dogs are licking his sores. And then you've got the rich man. He's bound up in sin. He's suffering the cost of sin even though he looks like he's living sumptuously. He's rich. He's got it all, clothed in fine linen and lives luxuriously every day. They both die and the roles are reversed. The rich man is now in torment in Hades and he cries out to God, give me just one drop of water. I'm tormented in these flames. Now Lazarus, he's on the other side and he's being taken care of by God in paradise. Wouldn't it be horrible to remain in a life of sin and wind up 
like the rich man, cost him his soul in hell, living in a place. Here's how Jesus described that place. Mark 9 verse 44, Jesus said, Hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That word for worm would be our word for maggot. What's hell like? It's like a place where there's a continual maggot eating on your flesh and nobody ever reaches over and turns the thermostat down. It is eternal torment. Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15, if you go to hell and if I go to hell, there'll be no getting out of it. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus described it as a place of outer darkness. The absence of light forever? Can you imagine that? It's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 8, and here's how Jesus likened hell in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. The scripture says, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Heaven is going to be eternal life, and hell, what's it going to be like? Everlasting punishment. It is the end result of what a life of sin will cost you. Friend, you don't want to go to hell. I can promise you. And thus, you don't want to live a life of sin. But now let's think about it from just a little bit different of an aspect. I know what sin will cost me. What did sin cost Jesus? I'll guarantee you, sin cost Jesus the most. It cost him greatly. Look at what sin cost the Savior from 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. The Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. What it cost the Savior? Jesus was in the very place we're trying to go, heaven itself. He left the glory of heaven, came to this earth, lived as a pauper, and he died for men. He gave it all up. John 3, 16, what it cost God? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Now, what do we mean it cost Jesus? Take your mind back to the events in Matthew 27. Jesus is now in the praetorium. They have placed a crown of thorns on his head. They now strike him on the head with a rod, piercing those thorns into his brow. They take Jesus and they hit him in the face. They spit on the Savior. They mock him. They take a cat of nine tails embedded with bone and glass and, and sharp rock and metal. And they rake that across the back of Jesus again and again. Then they put a robe on him and make fun of him more. And you can imagine the blood now adheres to the robe. And the Bible tells us they take that robe off. And the pain starts all over again. They take him up the hill to Golgotha. They nail his hands and feet to a, a Roman cross. And Jesus hangs there in agony, struggling for each breath until he says, It is finished. 1 Peter 2.24 records it this way. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He's the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sin. 1 John 2 verses 1 through 2. And I want you to notice what Isaiah said 750 years concerning the cost of sin to the Savior. Isaiah says, He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him <clears throat> stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. When we think about living a life of sin, when I'm tempted by sin and the lust of the flesh, what is it, what is one of the things that will help me to overcome that temptation? Friend, just stop and think about all that God did 
all that it costs Jesus and how much sin hurts God. Hebrews 10, 26 through 28 says, when we commit sin, we put Jesus to an open shame. We trample upon the Son of God. We take advantage of that great sacrifice. Are you living a life of sin today? Do you realize what sin will cost you? There will be no good come from a life of sin. You know, if you're honest with yourself, you know today the way of the sinner is hard. Why not let go of that life? Why not decide today, I want to give up the life of sin. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get right with God and to obey the gospel. Maybe you're thinking, what do I need to do? What must I do to be saved? What can I do to overcome a life of sin? You first have to hear God's Word. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to recognize this is God's message for man today. You then must believe that message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In John chapter 8, in verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. I've got to recognize Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. Then I must be willing to repent. That means I turn from sin and turn to God. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. I must make that good confession as is taught in Romans 10 verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And you must be baptized in water to have your sins washed away. Jesus said so clearly, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you let go of a life of sin? If not, friend, we beg you today, Think about the cost of sin to you. Think about what it costs the Savior and determine today, I'm going to rid my life of sin. I'm going to live for Jesus. I want to go to that beautiful place called heaven. We hope and pray you'll do that today as we study the gospel of Christ together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.